Hi, everyone. Welcome to World Changes in Tech by German Tech. My name is Anna Yukiko Bickenbach. I'm the program, program, program and event manager at German Tech. And today we are doing our part two of our music and tech series. Where we are talking about the accelerando of sustainability or the acceleration of sustainability in the industry. And we get to talk about how clean can music really be and with us, we have the expert Jakob Silvesta Bilabel with us. He's the founder and CEO of Green Music Initiative. And I'm very happy that he could join us today from a very beautiful and green background. Hello, Jakob. It's great to Hello. have you. Hello, Anna. Hey. <laughs> Where are you exactly? Um, I'm in the middle of Brandenburg. I'm deep in the heart of Brandenburg because I'm trekking with a few friends and what you see behind me is one of these corn corn things. And so I'm I'm near a lake which is called Krüppelsee. And this is where I am. I Wonderful. Can see. <laughs> and I think that's one of the great opportunities uh, that we have with technology is that we can connect from anywhere and everywhere. And um, she also mentioned, you know, talk about the sustainable development goals from the United Nations at our events. And I just wanted to underline the ones that we are going to have uh, represented in our talk. Uh, the first one is SEG4, quality education, because what Jakob is doing with the Green Music Initiative is to help uh, various uh, individuals and stakeholders in the industry to become more sustainable and to lower their CO2 footprint. Um, and we also have SCG9, which is Industry Innovation and Infrastructure, which hopefully we get to talk a little bit about the great projects uh, that he's initiated. And SCG11, Sustainable Cities and Communities, because we are bringing people together around the topic of music. And to merge all these things together um, and to have a nice introduction to Jakob, uh, I would like to, I wanted to know a quote of his that he really likes. And he said, talk without action equals nothing. So tell us what that, <laughs> where that came from. Well, to, to be honest, I think we're kind of overfed with talking, 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 talking. And the more I, I, was engaging myself into these issues, I, I, I came to the understanding that actually we know so much and we are able to describe barely everything, but I felt at some point the more we talk, the less we do. So at some point in my life, I made a decision and that decision is um, I would rather move into action i would rather move into actually doing something instead of only staying in a in a safe field where i only describe challenges and where i outline possible uh, solutions but but don't i'm not moving at all so this is why i'm so much into moving from from talking understanding into into the action field Okay, and um, let's let's talk about how you 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 know got into this whole area of music and sustainability, so we get a good background. From my understanding, is uh, you're a musicophile. If I I am I am what? <laughs> What's that? It's a musicophile. I don't know if I pronounce it correctly, but it's oh. love music. Um. Well, as it, 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 you. If if I am like heavily into music, is that that what musical? Yeah, that's the definition of being heavily into music. <laughs> well, to to be honest, I am. I am I am a passionate consumer, but I'm not so much into music itself. To be honest, I was I was raised and I was in a school where I learned to play some instruments, but this was oh, many many years ago. Like today, I'm. I was always more interested in the in the structural operational side of of music not not the only not only producing music more into what what operating system does does music need is it okay if I walk around or is it is it so distracting because I love to to walk around or is it too weird for me it's not distracting i think your viewers once said that it looks very beautiful so maybe okay. enjoying the scenery i think as long as we can hear you it's fine Go ahead. Okay, lovely. Good. So like I'm 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 more into the, the operational side of music. I'm I'm this is what this is what I would describe myself as. 
And how did that merge into starting the, the Green Music Initiative? So how did these two aspects combine before we talk about all the actionable things that we can do in the industry? But, but to be honest, um, it, it wasn't such a strategic move. It's not that at some point in my life I said, this is what I need to be doing. Um, it kind of fell upon me, I have to say. So I was, I was after my career in, in the actual music business, I started a Think Do Tank with a few partners. And as part of that, we are doing different stuff and different projects. And at some point, an, an old friend of mine approached me and said, Jacob, I, am, I'm, I understand that you're doing these sustainability stuff these days. How can my band tour green ever? And so it was more like a, somebody asking me something. And this is what, I, what, what pushed me into, into that direction. And out of that very first project, the Green Music Initiative, which you see today, is, is yeah, it's, it's built upon that. And how did the band fare with um, the question that they posed? Like, how did you? Oh, well, well we failed miserably because at, at that point we had no idea. We had no idea in, on, on how could a band tour green. And so I, at that point, I was, I was talking to my friend and he was the manager of that big band. And I said, why don't you go to Greenpeace? Why don't you ask the lovely people at Greenpeace? They should know. And then he went to Greenpeace and came back with them. Um, yeah, like it was an interesting meeting, but they had no solution neither. And in the end, they, they bought certificates. So they, they didn't change nothing in their actual procedures, but bought offsetting certificates. And, and well, it, so we failed miserably. So let's, let's stick with that. Because the question is, um, how... How good is, or how bad is music for the environment? Can you maybe run us through exactly that example with the band? Like, what are all these things that people don't see in the background that have a big carbon footprint, or what mm. impacting yeah. the environment? Well, well, first of all, yeah, thank you for that very good question, and I can answer it in a very short and precise way. Music at no point is bad for the environment. Um, if 60,000 people listen to music together at the festival, um, from, from, the, from the overall perspective, it's better than if 60,000 people would listen to music at home on their own. So it's, it's a more efficient way of the functional unit uh, listening to music. On the other hand, yes, you are right. If you have 60,000 people traveling from big cities into the green and back, you have mobility emissions. So um, music consumption at a festival or touring itself comes with a footprint, but it would be too too it would be too much of a simplification if you would only say this is only a negative impact. So if if I'm talking about impact, there is a negative impact which has to be reduced, which has to be made smaller at the at the most possible scale. On the other hand. Um, it has a positive impact on society. So if 60,000 people spend an amazing weekend out in the green experiences, uh, which are not, not to be bought for money, happen to them, and they come back into, into their normal life and something is changing. So it's, let, let's, not, let's not talk about the negative impact only, but it has a positive impact as well. This, okay. this, I just need to say mm -hmm. for a start. Of course, so, I mean, music is something that brings us all together. Um, yeah. What I was thinking is, you know, for someone who's never been to a festival, like yeah. what are the what are the things that that are negating the health of the environment? Well, first of all, that what what we usually think of when we say festival is something which is which is put on in the green. It's it's basically a temporary small city in the green. Like if you look around here. Mm -hmm. This this could be a festival site. It's perfect. Like there's nobody around, lots of space, nothing here. This could be a perfect festival site. Only here, there's no technical infrastructure here. So whatever you you set up, you have to tear down again. And this this is basically the the biggest challenge from an environmental point of view with a festival that 
all structures are temporary and for that reason these structures um, uh, are usually not very efficient. So every energy you're using you have to either produce it on site by generators running on diesel or even worse oil. Um, every resource you, you're using in that, in that production itself needs to be either carried, produced at, at, to the festival or, or you have to, to store it there. So everything you set up is, is, is very complicated to the way you would usually do it. And this makes up for the biggest footprint of the festival from a very top level. Um, it's the energy consumption on site. Mm -hmm. Then it's the, it's the mobility emissions. So the, so the travel emissions of either the artists or the audience. And then it's the resources. So these are the three impact categories coming from the biggest to, to not so big. And then the other impact categories are, are smaller. But you have to tackle energy, you have to tackle mobility, and you have to tackle resource. Okay. And when I think about resource, I also think of the individual. I mean, I remember going to Fusion and they have this incentivized system where everyone gets their like trash bag and 10 euros. And if you fill it up and bring it back, then you get your 10 euros back. So mm -hmm. it incentivizes people to clean up all the mess that they're bringing in with them. But I'm also thinking about all these. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I was just thinking about all these, uh, you know, the, the cycle of an individual's journey going through the festival, getting to the festival, going through the festival and coming back. I guess that's yeah. one side. And then you also have, as you said, the organizer side. Um, yeah. Well, this is, this is actually a very interesting example because most of the times when, when I got interviewed about festivals, people usually ask me, what about waste? What about... The, the piles of waste which are left behind on the festival sites. Well, to be honest, the actual numbers are not so high. And this sounds weird, but this is a true fact. So the, the energy production per day per visitor is roughly the same than the waste production you would have uh, in Berlin or Hamburg or London. But the, the difference is um, if if every restaurant in Berlin would put their waste out on the street, if every dinner shop or kebab shop or, or every speedy would put down their, their waste on, out on the street, it would look roughly the same. So at the festival, we see how much waste we're actually producing. And this is, this is a very big challenge because in the last five years, Germany, like us Germans, we are, we are European, we are the biggest waste producers in all of Europe, which is weird because um, uh, when you would ask someone, they would say, oh, we are in Germany, we are so good with waste separation, we are so good with, with reducing our waste, but we're actually not. Mm -hmm. So what you see on a festival is, is, is what is happening in the city where you don't see it. Then handing out a trash bag to your visitors um, is nice because then they do all the trash collecting for you but it, it, it doesn't tackle the, the, the source. It doesn't tackle the problem. It just tackles the symptoms of the problem. So I would rather ask my visitors to, to bring less stuff. I would ask my merchants to, to um, hand out meals on, on plates which are, which are not or are made of tin foil or plastic. So you have to tackle the waste challenge more at the source and not on the symptom. And yeah. if you would just ask your visitors, please collect your waste. You're not, you're not tackling the source, actually. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. I think that's a really great way to phrase it too. And I'd like to stay with that, tackling the source, because you've been yeah. doing this for almost, um, how long, like 15 years, I would say? Uh, 12, 12, we are, we are on a 13 year now. Okay, 13th year. And uh, when you look at tackling the source, how has that changed within the last 13 years of the things that you were able to identify and start working. Uh, well, the interesting thing is that um, when we started Green Music Initiative, uh, we were able to work with so amazing innovative festivals like the Melt Festival or the Boom in Portugal or the Roskilde in Denmark. And so I had the feeling, so that was such a big movement. But then I was realizing every festival was doing that on a voluntary basis. So there are no rules. It's not mandatory to, to create a smart energy plan for your festival. 
it's not mandatory to reduce your waste. It's not mandatory to, to put all these sustainability measures into place. So whatever these festivals were doing was because they had an interest, that, interest in, in working towards that goal. And that has changed. So when we started, it was only a few pioneers in the field. In the last five years, it kind of became the new normal. So you start in when you, when you start your sustainability journey, usually you start with something which feels doable. You start with something which you can tackle, like looking for waste or understanding your energy consumption. And then you move deeper and deeper to the core, to the source of it, because then you need to really understand your structural setup of your operations. Mm -hmm. You can only do such an amount of energy efficiency. At some point, it makes so much more sense to switch to green energy because then you don't have to save any energy anymore because if that energy is produced with renewables, it has no footprint. It comes with no footprint. And I would rather work with the festival saying, okay, please make the stage bigger, make it louder, more light, more fun, but please use renewable energy. So you're coming from understanding energy efficiency, like lowering your consumption, and at some point you switch into the world of renewables and then you can use as much energy as you want. And that has changed over the last five years. So we are moving from, from a pilot project here to a pilot project there to more a, I would say, a widespread understanding of these challenges in the sector. And with the widespread of challenges, does that mean these organizations are actually hiring people with the knowledge? I mean, are they also bringing people into the team so they can internally start creating, you know, these, these yeah, structures and, and goals that they're meeting? So do they have like a chief, chief of sustainability officer? Like, how do they implement <laughs> these things? Well, it, this, is, this, is, this is definitely a challenge. Some of the of the bigger companies, they, they have teams with people taking care of these issues. So the, the bigger promoters, which are responsible for one, two, three, or even more festival, they have these teams. Um, the smaller promoters, and by smaller, I mean, they, they have up to three festivals, they hire these people. So they, they, they are looking for external teams because a festival production is like, is like a moon landing. It's, it's a very dense way of working together over six weeks, over three months, and then usually they do other stuff. So you have both. You have either internal structures or you hire external experts, or you can work with us as Green Music Initiative and become part of a pilot project to, to really understand these issues in a more structural way. So this, this, these are ways how I would think the festival sector is moving towards, towards really understanding these goals. Okay, and you've seen, obviously, uh, the business has been growing on your end. I mean, not even business for profit, but I'm talking about um, in general. Uh, Jakob, are you still there? there I'm you. still there, here I am. You've seen an increase of uh, people coming to you, right? That has to be a good thing. Yes, well, Green Music Initiative over the years grow into a European network of more than 150 festivals. And we are acting as a, I would say, a innovation and research agency for the sector. Um, that means we, we operate big network projects. And to be honest, we, we grew with the growth of the sector. So the festival sector before Corona grow on a two digit basis from year to year. I mean, everybody was understanding that at some point that there were so many new festivals and, and beside the new festivals, even the old festivals are growing, growing by audience numbers, growing by stages. Um, so yeah, we, we grew with the sector, yeah. So, and, and talking about growing with the sector, let's get to the nitty gritty. I think what everyone's also very curious about is to talk about some of the pilot projects so we can actually get an idea of um, where we are now and where the future can go in terms of um, cleaner music. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was Do you open have, question. let's start with, okay, let's start, so let's start with um, one thing I know that, that's, that's uh, been very interesting to observe is uh, there's a hydrogen fuel cell um, yeah. movement that yeah. uh, 
uh, I believe uh, you've, you are a part of. So why don't we start with that first when we're, yeah. ta we're talking about energy, the source of energy and being the number one or priority yeah. or the most important thing at a festival. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm happy to do that because this is, an, this is a great project to, to explain the, 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 the genesis. How did, we, how did we get where we are right now? So in the past, we, we really took some effort in understanding energy efficiency. So we tried to understand how to lower the energy consumption by stages, how to lower the overall energy consumptions by smart metering systems. So we were totally on, on the side of energy efficiency. But the Green Music Initiative being a network of these festivals, um, once in a year, we, we meet with our board. And in these board meetings, we, we establish a, a shared vision. We establish a, a, a goal to, to, to really move towards. And one of these goals was, okay, uh, um, at some point we would love to really understand of how could we run a festival on renewables 100%. How, how and when could, could this, this be put into action? And um, since, since that, that mission has been established, we were looking for ways of making that happen. And hydrogen as an energy storage could exactly deliver that. Because just for an example, usually like I told you, a festival is powered by, by generators. Running on diesel, um, emitting loads of CO2 emissions, being really expensive, really complicated. A festival like Glastonbury has 250 generators on, on the site. 250 and the, the energy consumption by the British festival industry is 1.3 million liters of diesel every summer. 1.3 million liters of diesel. And can you just imagine the emissions coming with that? And this is only the UK and if you, I think you can easily, um, put that times 20 for a rough idea of the, of the energy consumption diesel wise of the sector. Mm -hmm. And hydrogen is, is such a lovely energy storage because um, it, it basically allows you to, to set up an energy plan with generators, but these generators don't produce any CO2 emissions anymore because instead of diesel, very, very uh, bluntly put, um, you're using hydrogen as an energy storage. In comparison to batteries, well, which could, could uh, store electric energy as well, um, you, there's no problem with recharging. So an, a, an electric battery, you have to recharge at some point, you have to plug it to the grid. And hydrogen fuel cell, you can just recharge it because it's, it's, it's a gas, it's a condensed gas. So the hydrogen project we're in right now is, something we were striving for for like i would say five years minimum and now we have that project in which we produce hydrogen generators and offer them to the european festival sector oh wow when is this and what has this <laughs> started or when will it start yeah, oh, uh, yeah. We have a little break now in the <laughs> festival season well yes that project has been running we are now in our third year the, these, these fuel cells are produced, um, but then Corona kicked in. So uh, we have them right now. They are in a factory in, uh, in Italy, in Milan. And without, without um, Corona, they would have been showcased on 15 festivals over the summer. Um, now no festivals are taking place. Uh, so we have to wait until next summer to showcase them but uh, they are there, they are producing energy, they are big. We have a 25 uh, kilowatt and 100 kilowatt, which is quite big, well, big enough to power a big stage. And so these are not even prototypes anymore. These are fully functional fuel cells. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, and now I'm thinking, um, let's say I'm a, I'm a uh, this is to get your uh, advice. Let's say I'm a small festival person, organizer of a festival, let's say a thousand <laughs> people, and I don't necessarily have the funds to get <laughs> one of these hydrogen fuel cells for, for a battery back or for a battery. Um, what are maybe the five things that this person could think about implementing in order to start 
reducing their carbon footprint. So I need to know, how big is your festival? Uh, thousand people. Thousand people. Uh, where does it take place? In Brandenburg. In Brandenburg. Do you have a grid connection? Yes, why not? Okay, so you're, you're using grid, grid mm -hmm. energy. Okay. I'm using grid energy. And if I didn't use grid energy because maybe the owners decided we we're going to be too loud and, you know, uh, too preposterous, then we have to actually go off grid. Off grid. Okay. So, um, first of all, it's, it's the, the first step usually is to break down that whole idea of sustainability into, into different working packages. And that means you need, you need to understand your impact categories and you need to understand where your hot spots lie. This is important because usually when you start your journey towards sustainability or even start your journey towards a climate neutral a festival, you are sometimes overwhelmed by the sheer number of possible measures. So in the beginning, you have to, have to understand where your hotspots are. Um, your hotspot could be energy. Your hotspot could be mobility. Your hotspot could be water. For example, if your festival is next to a lake and you have all these people jumping into the lake um, uh, covered in sunscreen and washing their, their hair in that lake, then that, that could be a challenge. So you have to understand and map out your indicators, first step. Second, set, second step is usually come up with a structure of measurement of these indicators. Like the Brits say, what you measure, you will manage. And that helps you to understand your, your progress or if numbers are decrease or if numbers are increasing, you have to, you have to you have to track some numbers. So first you understand where your hotspots are, second you, you track your numbers. And then you take it from there. Um, take it from there means once you understood your hotspots, once you understand your data, you, you set some goals. And these goals could be, okay, in the first three years we want to lower our energy footprint by 30%. So you have to set so, some goals because otherwise it's, it becomes very vague like Oh, should we do this? Should we do that? And you have to really see where, where your leverages are. And once you have set these goals, the best thing is to sit together with your team and, and really open and transparent talk about your goals and ask your team members what, what he or she has, thinks about that and what kind of ideas they are, they are able to offer to the process. Because you want to, you want to onboard them. Sustainability is not, it's not a solo show. It's, it's, a joint, it's a joint project. You need to co-create these processes. And then at the very earliest level, get your, get your partners on board, get your service providers on board, get the people who deliver you the stage on board. And, and the, more, the, the clearer you are about your missions and your indicators, the easier it is for them to onboard. Uh, I'm, I'm really breaking that down into these, these kind of steps because very often when, when festivals start that sustainability journey, they, they really start without a program and start here, do something there, and then enter with a mess of nice measures, but usually they don't work together. Mm -hmm. So these would be the five steps. So understand your hotspot, set your goals, on, onboard your team, onboard your partners, track your data, uh, and uh, uh, watch these, these measures, these creatively co-created measures put into action and then, then track the numbers again to see where, how, how these measures make sense. Because sometimes you, you think of something which looks very good on the paper but has no impact at all. And some other measures, they, they look very silly on paper but have such a big impact. And this differs from festival to festival. So if you're a small festival, this is why I'm asking, if you're a small festival with a thousand people in the region of Brandenburg, I would think you are very regional. At best, you're very grounded in, in regional structures. And I would think that you have a direct line with your audience. You, you know who they are. You can send them an email. You can tell them about your mission. You can tell them, listen, um, I am, we, are, we, are setting, we, are, we are about to set the German Tech Festival in Brandenburg. 
these are our objectives, please help us to reach these objectives because there are some objectives which, which we as German Tech Festival can do on our own, but with others we need you. So if it is about uh, uh, waste reduction, you can only do it with your attendance. And so you have to reach out at the earliest level and you have to create these narrative. It's a storyline in the end. It's a story you tell. And I think Does that, that help? Was, yes, that was perfect because I think this doesn't even um, only address uh, festivals, but it addresses any venue. So anyone who's listening, who has a friend that owns a music venue, it seems like these are five really good steps that you can uh, uh, take. Start. No, I think, I mean, I mean uh, Anna, obviously you, you with German Tech, you have many projects running. It's, it's every transformation project, every change management project needs these steps. And it's not different if you run a festival or want, want to create a sustainability culture in a big company. The steps are always the same. Um, you are used to these projects, I know that. Yes, exactly. And I think that's why it's great that we can uh, create this dialogue for people to understand, you know, where they, where they go into um, making talk actionable. And yeah. <laughs> uh, I wanted to, I wanted to stick uh, to, to the people who are listening to music, not on the side yeah. of the organization. So, you know, we all listen to music. Are there some, I don't want to call it hacks, but are there things that we can do as music listeners that would, you know, be better uh, for the environment when it comes to music, like uh, when I think about streaming, for example, you know, I'm not buying CDs anymore. So I think, oh, you know, maybe I'm getting rid of some of the, you know, this whole packaging and things. Like, are there yeah. other things that we can do as music listeners and lovers? Yeah, <laughs> buy, buy records. <laughs> Don't stream. <laughs> so buy records. No, no, no buy, buy records. Because it, it, is as, it is exactly as you put it. We, we think because we got rid of the physical product, the CD itself, that the, the footprint which comes along with it has somehow evaporated, which is true. On the other hand, if, if you stream a track from Spotify, Deezer, iTunes, whatever, there is a cloud and that cloud is, is run on energy. And we have no understanding if these servers are run on renewable energy, if these servers are run efficiently, because it's, it, this, is the, this is the elephant in the room. Oh, and, this is um, the elephant in the room. Okay, so next it, time I'll ask Spotify to do, a, to do an interview with us so we can ask them. <laughs> uh, you, you, have, you have to ask them because the, the, the energy consumption of the server parks over the last 10 years, uh, they, they grew exponentially it's crazy it's crazy it's crazy and there is no disclosure of the data so it's there is no way that spotify discloses the data there's no way that amazon where which runs one of the biggest server parks of the world is disclosing their data they have one of these green projects where they say well we have efficient service but the overall consumption is crazy. And just, just to give you, give you a rough idea, like um, when, when, when you were listening to music in the past, you would listen to one track and then another track, and maybe even a third track. Now every track merges into the next one. If you're, if you're watching a Netflix night, Netflix at some point asks, asks you if you're still watching because the, the movies, they, they don't stop anymore. So they're going on and on and on and on. Um, it's weird because they, they want to create that stickiness. They want you, want you to stay with their platform, which, and then they create a, an, an ongoing stream. Ongoing stream means ongoing data, which needs to be distributed, which needs to be stored somewhere. So please start asking your platforms where, where the energy comes from. Please do. Wonderful. I like, I really enjoyed that part. Um, so I think now to, to summarize every, uh, everything, I, we also wanted to ask uh, our audience, uh, you know, maybe where they're tuning in from and if they have any questions, uh, if you do feel free to uh, ask some of the questions now and I will try to take one or two. Um, and I think Petra actually just asked a question that we, that we were talking about. She asked, Petra, is asking, would you say that vinyl PVC and its offset has less of an environmental impact than music streaming? And I think you broadly 
kind of answered the question. Yes. Uh, in comparison, but I, I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy to go into more detail because it, it, it doesn't feel so natural in my number, but I have to explain. So the, the thing is, um, I, I was engaged in many projects about carbon footprint, and so I understand life cycle assessment. Life cycle assessment means um, you, if, you, if you want to understand the footprint of a product or a service, you have to look at the whole life cycle. Um, if, if you look at the life cycle of a, of a record, vinyl, PVC, um, you have to look as well on the life cycle of on the hardware which you which you need to play that record. And I would ask everybody in the audience, when did you buy your last record player, and how long did did it stay with you? Uh, then the answer usually is, well, I bought a record player once in my life or twice, and I had it for like ten years or even longer. I I still own my Technics record players. Um, then the CD came. For the CD, you needed another hardware. You needed the CD player. Um, these CD players, we had three to five years. Then we switched to MP3 players to play these MP3 downloads. You, we used to download these. And then these MP3 players, we had one, two, three maximum years. Now the hardware we're using for, for listening to music is our, our device, is, is our mobile phone. And these mobile phones, on average, we have for 12 months or 18 months maximum. Mm -hmm. So you have to look either as well on the, on the product itself, which is a functional unit, and the hardware you need. And then you understand, so if you buy a record and listen to it over and over and over again on the same hardware, there's no more resources needed than the actual energy. If you stream a track, on, on a device which you need to change every 18 months because it's old, then you understand this is crazy. And this is why the overall emission of the vinyl record on, based on the functional unit on listening to one track is much lower than the screen. Does that make sense? That makes sense. I mean, I know my father has uh, three record players and maybe two, and he has all his records um and so that is the it's not planned obsolescence right i mean back exactly. then it was about quality <laughs> i mean i mean you can you sit i mean you can still go on a flea market and buy a perfectly record which you can still listen to even if it's from 1960 whatever and it sounds perfectly well good luck finding a cd from mid 90s which which doesn't skip yeah um, exactly. And uh, there's, there's one question here from Steve, but I'm not sure I understand the question correctly, Steve. So Steve is, Steve is asking, has there been any move to reduce the speed of turnover since the pandemic? Well, turnover of what? Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Steve, if you could just, do you mean the, oh, if technology. So he's asking whether or not Corona has had any effect on technology change or turnover. Uh, That's a very tricky question because it's very theoretical, I think. But, you know, I think it, Jakob yeah. might have some grasp on it. Yeah, it is. Well, it, it, it is a very good question. And I'm, I'm trying not to think it's, it's asked on a rhetoric basis because exactly the question should always be answered with yes because every crisis asks for a acceleration of innovation processes to be put into place. This is, this is a given. This is, but the actual situation is not something we are used to. So I would say Yes, it puts so much pressure on actual change processes in the sector. It puts so much pressure on really ramping up our businesses towards whatever kind of new normal. But what makes it really hard right now is that many, many of the actors we are working with are so on the ground right now, they are grasping for breath in a very uh, to, to, to paint a picture, they are lying on the ground and it's really hard to talk to somebody who is really fighting for their life. And I'm just using the picture now. Mm -hmm. um, and I, if, if I would have to say a very personal uh, uh, 
look at that, I would say it would take another three to six months to, to fully start the acceleration process of new technical innovations put into place because right now everybody's just trying to stay alive. Yeah, and uh, I think I think you you put it together really well. And uh, just to also let our listeners know that part three next week we will actually be talking to Wacken Wildcat PR wow. as well as yeah. United. We we stream Cook um, Commission. We're talking to all their representatives um, to talk about exactly this question of how is the industry changing? Where are the opportunities arising from now with COVID nineteen? You know how are yeah. our coping with it and and they themselves so i think that's a really great way for us to kind of also um, move into to the next part which will be next week and um Jakob, i would really like to thank you for joining us uh in the deep brandenburg it was really wonderful <laughs> that you were able to take us on a journey of what it means to have for for music to become more sustainable and i think we got a really great deep insights from you. Um, I do have one more tidbit. It's, it's, yeah. it's a quick, quick fire. I will ask you 10 questions and just feel free to react to them uh, as, as you would, just intuitively. I hope I'm just that going into the, into the middle of that big field here so that you can have a, a view around because it's, there's nobody here. This is Brandenburg, I love it. Isn't it's, it crazy? It's beautiful. It is. And <laughs> it's beautiful. No, it, it's, it's wonderful. And I think um, it, it's great. And now we can go on a little, a, on a little personal level for, yeah. for our viewers and our listeners. Yeah. And I will ask you these 10 quick, rapid questions. What is yeah. your, who, who or what is your favorite band? Uh, my favorite band ever. Ever, if you just had to choose one, I know it's sometimes difficult, but maybe it's yeah. like one that inspired you. A band I could live without, couldn't live without, yeah. uh, are the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Because when I was young, they really were the soundtrack of my growing, growing into becoming an old man. Crazy band. It's not. It's not. It's not very chic, but I, I love them. Red or chili peppers. Okay, what is your favorite tech gadget? Tech gadget. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the tech gadget I, I couldn't, I could possibly not live without is my navigation system because this eased my life so much. I can, I can go wherever I want and can always come home. You can navigate yourself into the nature and come back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> What's, what animal would you like to cuddle the most? If, with what animal I would love to cuddle? cuddle? What animal would you like to cuddle? Um, a, a bear. I would love to cuddle a bear, if that would be possible. And in some places <laughs> it is possible. I, just don't, I don't know if this is around it, but it's possible. Uh, country you would like to visit? Georgia. Uh, Georgia, not the state, but the country. No. Yeah. No, Georgia, Georgia, in, 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 in Southeast Europe. I think this is yeah, one Georg of the, uh -huh. it's, how you, how you pronounce it, Georgia? I guess, it, I know German Georgian, but Georg yeah, it would be Georgia. That's why I just want to make a distinct uh, clarity between the country yeah, and, if, and the U.S. If, if there wouldn't be Corona, I, I would have traveled there with a few friends because it's like, it, it, everything I saw, everything, I, every story I heard is like crazy beautiful. Okay. Person you would like to meet? Living or dead? It doesn't matter. God. Okay. Uh, a vegetable you like to eat the most? Hmm. Possible cucumbers. Ooh. And your favorite tree? Tree? Yes, favorite tree. Tree. My favorite tree. Um, platanen? How you pronounce it? Platanen? Oh, platanen? I wouldn't know. Maybe. I don't know. We'll leave it at platanen. Probably have platanen. To Leo um, they, they, they look like very... Uh, um, in, uh, when you see one, you know it's a platanen. Ah, it like, a so like the Jurassic plants? That's Exactly. That very, 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 very old. Ferns. Yeah. I think they're yeah. called ferns. 
concerned. Yeah, could be. Yeah. So, okay, thank you. That's it. Thank you, Jakob, for the, <laughs> for the deep <laughs> insights into, you know, uh, like I said, your knowledge and on a personal level. It was wonderful having you here. I'm really glad technology enabled you to join us uh, from, from Pantenburg, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of the time uh, yeah. wandering the countryside. Yes. And with everybody, the, everybody should do that once in a while, like just just two days out with a few friends in in the green at like I mean it's this is just an hour away from Berlin and it feels like another planet here. And with that I think I will I will thank our audience for joining us as well and hope that everyone gets to enjoy some sunshine if they're here on European time. And uh, thank you so much, Jakob. And we will talk again soon and see the rest of you guys hopefully next week and at the rest of our World Changers and Tech events. Goodbye. Goodbye.